any information about the invasion and conflict in Ukraine. When you think in Nicaragua, where you can lose your citizenship for journalism, you can get killed, you can get attacked, but your status is now being affected. So there is clearly much uh, tighter, stronger attacks on the media. Uh, and of course, while authoritarian states have always been there, there is a rising trend of authoritarianism in existing and emerging democracies. India is the best example of that. Uh, so the, there is a what we have said in the declaration, the backsliding of human rights. So on the one hand, there are states that never have upheld human rights, uh, who are now becoming bolder about what they are doing. And then there are existing democracies that feel it is fine to uh, suppress uh, media and continue to call themselves uh, democracies. But then there's this third factor of digital technology. Uh, we all are, are, of course, aware of uh, generative AI and we're talking about it, but digital technology has transformed the way in which news is produced, shared, consumed, uh, distributed. Um, and that, that has, of course, boosted media in many ways. And I think it's important to recognize that. <clears throat> but it has totally flipped certain ideas and concepts on their head. The citizen journalist, for example. Mm -hmm. So when we have to talk about protection of journalists, safety of journalists now, we have to talk about citizen mm -hmm. journalists. Exactly. It's, much uh, it's a much broader concept now. But at the same time, uh, responsibilities or manipulation of the media has also increased disinformation, disinformation, and most importantly, the financial viability, the economic viability of the media has been challenged. Uh, we have now what is called media deserts, where small outlets, community outlets are disappearing, mm -hmm. and you're being fed uh, through uh, social media channels, the news. A community, at the community level, media has, is, is struggling. And, and we know that at the end of the day, when we're talking about human rights, we're talking about people, we're talking about communities. So with all these different changes coming, uh, we've, you know, that of course uh, is, is what sort of made us feel that at this moment, we need to clarify what, why the media is valuable, why the media needs to be preserved, send a very clear message to stakeholders about that, and then set out what needs to be done to create that uh, conducive environment, uh, what states should and shouldn't do, uh, and what media itself should do, and what how the digital technology sector should uh, look at the media. You mentioned in particular that, Teresa, you were a very strong advocate for this particular topic and media and its role for democracy. And the joint declaration this year, kind of uniquely or differently from before, has set out kind of a strong kind of framing the topic section, which really talks about this issue. You know, why did you particularly feel that it was important to include that reminder in the framing section of media's role for democracy? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you also for being here and, uh, uh, and uh, to participate, I hope, uh, in our discussion uh, a little bit later. And, uh, and that's true. Uh, the idea was that we really need to put together all the elements that clearly highlight the importance of media for democracy and how media are really a key pillar um, of democracy. We had in the past a lot of uh, joint declarations. Uh, for more than 20 years, they have been, uh, they have been delivered uh, uh, each year, but, uh, but it, they were always focusing in a particular uh, in a particular aspect that is related to uh, to the media, to freedom of expression. And uh, what we thought is that it was time to have to have a look on a holistic manner uh, uh, to the importance of the media and the clear link uh, of media uh, to democracy. And uh, what is uh, what is interesting? Of course, the authoritarian um, governments they know quite well uh, why media uh, why media are important uh, and uh, how media can really um, uh, can really uh, help to 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 promote uh, democracy to uh, 
uh, to contribute uh, to uh, a debate within society. And that's the reason why uh, they do whatever they can to silence media. But maybe what we are not so much aware is that uh, um, in many democracies, the governments, of course, they know, they say, but are they really aware of the importance of democracy? And to tell you the truth, I don't think so. And it's very interesting because one of these days, uh, um, a journalist, uh, he came and he was uh, talking with me, an American one, and he was telling me, you know, you're right. I'm sure that uh, if I go to the Congress, if I if I go to the Senate, okay, they say, yes, media freedom is important, it's a constitution, but are they really aware of the importance of media for democracy? I'm not so sure. And this is alarming. Is alarming, and that's the, that's the reason why we should really um, uh, raise awareness of this importance, of this clear link, and fight for it. Um, and this is uh, very much the reason why um, uh, we thought that uh, to have uh, this holistic, a comprehensive um, uh, joint declaration, putting uh, together all the elements that explain why media are important for democracy in one side, and at the same time uh, to really um, identify the measures that need to be taken by the different stakeholders, by the states, by the, uh, by the, 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 the platforms who completely uh, put upside down the media sector, as we all know, uh, and I'm not demonizing because, uh, of course, they, they, they did a lot uh, for uh, freedom of expression, uh, but also uh, a set of recommendations to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to, the media, uh, to the media outlets. And uh, it was also important, and uh, that's the reason why uh, we, we, we also include two notions uh, in the scope of these recommendations, which I think are very important. One, it's uh, content of public interest, just to, you know, to try to differentiate. It's not all the content. It's the content of public interest that really can contribute to sustain democracy. Um, so this was one, an important pillar, um, which I think is a step further regarding just freedom of expression. Um, uh, and uh, it's intermediation, it's scrutiny, it's, it's, it's something that is different and really key uh, to, support, uh, uh, to support the public debate uh, in, our, in our societies. And the second notion that is already there is media freedom. Uh, what is it? My mandate is the representative um, on freedom of the media. And this is unique. There is no other mandate with media freedom. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there are freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, but media freedom is something that is very particular uh, and uh, it's very much uh, uh, ingrained in the comprehensive security approach um, of the OSCE. The OSCE is a security organization. And we have this, uh, uh, this media freedom also as part of the agenda that is needed within the security organization to, um, to, 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 to have an agenda and to build an agenda for peace and for security. And this is uh, the reason why we also had these two notions, which I think are very important. Um, content of public interest and media freedom. Um, so I think that- uh, This kind of frames it relative to the bill. Thank yeah. you for that. I mean, it, as you mentioned, it's very- I can continue. No, I, I, think, don't I think we need, there's a lot to unpack and I think we're going to get to, to do that. It's very interesting what you say. I think there's increasingly research that's come out about, um, you know, the the way that the freedom of expression is addressed in democracies in the sense of the lack of expression and the attacks on expression seem to be a clear leading indicator for increasing autocracy. But the way that you also frame it as well, that we still need to argue for the value of media in democracy, in the positive democratic states, I think is really well taken. 
Um, Pedro, if I could turn to you a bit. One of the things in terms of the protection of, of media freedom is the protection of journalists. We heard yesterday some stories of people, incredibly courageous journalists, incredibly courageous individuals. And I know that you in particular have focused on the protection of journalists in, in your region. You know, what is it about um, these, these issues beyond physical attacks that we've heard about that you think the Joint Declaration is really pointing to this year in terms of recommendations? Thank you, Queen. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, I would like to talk about the attacks to which journalists are exposed uh, regarding your question. Um, and, and I mean, it's not, now it's easier to get access to information through internet, but also uh, journalists are receiving a lot of threats and attacks uh, through social media and different platforms, including the spyware. Um, our office, uh, at the OAS has monitored, for example, how high authorities uh, are using their uh, personal or institutional social media uh, uh, accounts to denigrate, to uh, discredit journalism. And that opens uh, a enormous space for, for, I mean, like tolerance to attacks, uh, even permission uh, is, is, is an incentive to attacks journalists. So that's why, and it is not the first time we, we say that, no. Uh, um, we have targeted that political leaders should avoid making stigmatization and denigrating st statements against journalists and the media, and that uh, they should promote measures to prevent any form or uh, on digital harassment. Uh, we have uh, followed situations in which journalists have been victims of attacks and even uh, murders because of attacks. Recently, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, ruled a case of Leguizamón Saban versus Paraguay, uh, and, the, and, and the state was condemned uh, because the investigation did not meet the, the, the standards of diligence, reasonable time, uh, did not follow any logical line of investigation. And I think this present reiterates uh, a lot of the things that should happen uh, when when journalists uh, uh, are attacked for doing their work. Then uh, also there are other uh, angles that are taken in, in, in these joint declarations, just, such as the protection of sources of journalists. Um, and, and, and also uh, we have talked about the, the, I mean, this year's joint declaration seeks the establishment of alert and rapid response mechanisms when there's evidence of harassment, the persecution or attacks against journalists uh, to freedom sources, of freedom of, of sources, sorry. To this end, it, it is important that state authorities investigate and punish the perpetrators of attacks against journalists Impunity is detrimental and only increases the, exist the existence of these events that are so damaging to journalism. Um, thirdly, another of the measures that the Joint Declaration is calling for is the protection of journalists uh, from the use of uh, strategic lawsuits against public participation of, or slaps. Um, recently, uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights issued the ruling in the case of Palacio Rutia versus Ecuador. Uh, this, this case established that public officials should be prevented from restore, resorting lawsuits uh, for, for libel or slander when their objective is not to obtain rectification, but to silence criticism of their actions in the public sphere. And uh, the court was emphatic in determining that that is a threat to freedom of expression and democracy. Um, there is an undeniable need for states to regulate the abusive of use of judicial mechanism aimed at curtailing freedom of expression. In both cases, the case of Álvarez Ramos and uh, Palacio Rutia, uh, the Inter-American Court has established the prohibition of the use of criminal law to punish critical speech against the authorities. Uh, however, however, it is important that procedural mechanisms to be created uh, in order to prevent civil lawsuits from silencing or disproportionately affecting those who are sued by the authorities, especially journalists and the media. Uh, 
I, I want to be clear, I mean, slabs harm freedom of expression. Uh, and having anti-slab measures in place will allow for media plurality and diversity and prevent the authorities from indirectly affecting journalistic and communication activities. Many countries, I mean, uh, ha, are discussing or have already installed uh, the so-called anti-slab motion, which is a judicial mechanism that allows slab defendants to, to request, request the dismissal of the case on the ground that it, it, it is in fact a slab lawsuit. This prevents journalists and media outlets from being part of lengthy and onerous proceedings and instead of allows them to continue their reporting work. It is important to adopt regulations similar to those ones. I think that, that that's a path we should be moving forward, um, which provides procedural tools for judges to dismiss cases where the motivation is to silence journalism. Uh, finally, it is necessary for states to provide protection to whistleblowers and sources. In, in a recent case, a recent hearing uh, at the Inter-American Court, in the case of Viterium Garretti versus Ecuador, the commission presented a case uh, uh, to the court, uh, an extraordinary opportunity uh, to develop standards for the protection of whistleblowers of, uh, I mean, on, on acts of corruption in this case. Um, um, in conclusion, uh, it is important that the state authorities have adequate mechanisms for the protection of journalists, both uh, digital and uh, in analog, I mean, online and offline space, uh, and prevent the use of cyber surveillance against journalists, uh, ensure the protection of journalistic sources, uh, prevent the use of slaps, and provide recognition and protection to whistleblowers. Thank you very much, Pedro. And I think some of you may have been in the session prior to this one at the launch of Reporter Shield, which is you know a mechanism to try and address or help mitigate the the negative impact of of the slaps on journalism. So I think that's a very interesting initiative that we'll be looking at kind of closely going ahead. But when we talk about media freedom, we we can't just speak about interference in the work of media and journalism by the states. It's importantly that we look at Broadly, and the Joint Declaration does this in terms of control of the media by commercial and other interests, including in the digital ecosystem. It also outlines recommendations for states on how to respond to this risk head on, both online and offline, as part of their positive obligations to ensure protection of pluralism and diversity in this digital age that we live in. So this issue of commercial capture and control is a worldwide problem. Irene, Teresa, are either of you able to kind of talk a little bit about, Irene, maybe you, about why this is particularly an issue that is tackled head on in the joint declaration this year? Um, you know, what we're doing in the joint declaration, because it's a declaration about media freedom and democracy, Irene, we are, you. Uh, because we are talking about media freedom and democracy, not just media freedom by itself, mm -hmm. we are looking to see how democracy is being affected by media. And negatively and positively. And when we look at that closely, we find in, in the authoritarian states, of course, media is controlled by the state. But in democratic state, states, media is increasingly being captured by commercial, large commercial interests, business interests. Uh, and we have what I would call media oligarchs or media barons. We know them well here in the United States. <laughs> and so I have, uh, a year ago when I did my report on uh, uh, reinforcing media freedom and safety of journalists, there were three pillars, which uh, of course, um, uh, Pedro has uh, very eloquently described how physical attacks take place, how surveillance and technological attacks are taking place. And then of course, the legal attacks. But beneath that, the environment in which journalists are being, are working, are being captured on the one hand by states, and authoritarian states, and on the other hand by business interests. And media is because in these open economies, media is being treated as just another commercial interest. And UNESCO, as you, some of you will remember, has talked about media as a public good. Uh, media is a human right, media freedom is a human right, but media freedom is also a public good. If it's a public good, do we leave it to the market to determine uh, the supply of clean water, for example, 
we do not. Let's, let's hope in not. Power. Some cases, some states do think that you should do that. But, no, but it isn't because it is, it is a human right. Mm -hmm. Access to water is a human right. We say media freedom is a human right, in which case we should be looking at it in a different way. And yet, what, we, what do we see? We see these media barons and media oligarchs coming in. And we see even worse than that, lack of transparency about who is actually owning the media. But I went to Hungary, for example. Uh, and Hungary is very proud to call itself an illiberal democracy. Um, there, of course, the media ownership is very interesting. It is, you know, it is it's so opaque. Uh, it's uh, own, uh, you know, oligarchs, uh, friends of the, uh, Mr. Orban come in, purchase uh, these outlets, and then a foundation is created, and the outlets are then part of the foundation, and the foundation has a board on which uh, friends of the yes. government uh, uh, governing party sit on it. It's a complicated uh, structure there. And one of my recommendations was uh, uh, transparency of media, media ownership, and the government responded to me, the European Union has no requirement for media trans ownership to be transparent, mm -hmm. and it is correct. Mm -hmm. So here is a region which is, uh, uh, has a strong regional human rights system, is very progressive champion of human rights, but does not uh, talk about media ownership. Extremely worrying that one of the most valuable assets of democracy is covered in opacity. Thank you very much, Irene. Yeah, yeah. Oh. there is a, a question. Yeah, please. It precisely that happened afterwards. Indeed, one of my recommendations to the European Union from my visit to Hungary was, please look at the issue of media ownership. But that act has not been adopted yet. It's still, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, they're only talking about it now because we are raising it. Teresa, did you want to add anything on this in, in your role in OSC in terms of the European Media Freedom Act? Are there any comments that you wanted to make yes. around that in particular? Yes, yes, yes. But uh, I think that uh, regarding, regarding the European Union, some important steps have been taken. Mm? And let's be very clear because I do remember I worked for a long, long time with uh, uh, with uh, all the negotiations uh, regarding uh, the audiovisual sector uh, mm -hmm. within. And I do remember that uh, we only look at, uh, uh, at the audiovisual as uh, an in uh, a service of the internal market. And this was the reality, and it's only now, uh, it's, and it's very recent mm -hmm. that uh, the European Union is looking at media, not just as a a service of the internal market, but on the contrary, is looking at it through the lens of human rights. And this is a gigantic yeah. step. Yeah. It's a gigantic yeah. step and it's very, very important. Of course, it's not yet adopted, but uh, there, there are uh, important, uh, in very, very important steps and I hope it can create, um, you know, a... Uh, 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 the 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 right environments uh, to really to 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 have a positive influence not only in the European Union but beyond the European Union. But that's very true. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, ownership transparency it's very important. Uh, the capture by uh, the capture uh, by by some business interests it's very clear regarding uh, regarding the, the the media. It's happening. Uh, in the United States, and it was the authorities of the United States that told me that this is happening, for example, at the local level, and why vulture funds are buying uh, are buying uh, uh, local media, and why is it happening? This is happening because it's the at the local level, the lack of tr the the trust uh, on media is higher than regarding uh, the national media. So this is where uh, the, the business world wants to have an influence and wants to be. And, and this is alarming. So it's not just, it, it, the, the media are being treated as a commercial com commodity on the, no, it's much, it goes beyond this. It's it, it really, it's, uh, it's part, of uh, of 
other interests uh, of political agendas. It's not for business. In this case, uh, in 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 the U.S., it's not it's it's not about business. They don't. It's not to to have a, a flourishing business to make a lot of money. No, it's really to pursue a political agenda. And this is very, very concerning. Just to clarify, when I said commercial, being treated as a commercial commodity, the same rules that yeah. apply to business, yeah. that anyone can go in and buy whatever you yeah, want yeah. to buy, yeah. is a, being applied to the yeah, media. Yeah. But of course, those who are buying media outlets know very well that media doesn't make big profits. No. So they're not going in to make profits. No. Mm -hmm. But the state treats media in most countries, treats media yeah, yeah. as though it is like any other business. I think the the point that you're making about people don't go into the media to make big profits, this is another issue that's discussed, just to, to point out, in the joint declaration in terms of media viability. We heard a lot yesterday, yeah. the financial sustainability. Teresa, you mentioned people buying the small outlets because people trust them more. Um, Irene, you also talked a, a little bit about this. So just to, to mention before we move on that this issue of media sustainability and viability is actually touched on quite a bit in terms of the, the joint declaration, kind of getting a little bit more in depth on the comments that you both had said. Um, and in course, the comments around media sustainability is very much related to, I don't think we can avoid it, the issue of online platforms. You know, we heard yesterday, or not, yes, yesterday, that 50% of the online ad revenue now goes to basically Google or Facebook, the large platforms fundamentally changing the business model of media. I think we all we all know that very well. The advertiser-based model that sustained it for 30, 40 years is no longer um, in place. So given that and given the rise, Teresa, of the, the importance of the social media platforms, as you mentioned at first, in freedom of expression and freedom of the media, and in terms of the media sustainability and viability now, what are some of the key recommendations of the joint declaration in addressing the new online space and addressing the role of the social media companies? You know, let's go to, to the, 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 the core of the, of the question, not so much the recommendations. The recommendations, are, uh, they are uh, clearly outlined here in the, in the joint declaration. Anyone can read, they are very clear. So uh, uh, let, let's look at it uh, from another, another perspective, if you allow me. Mm -hmm. And what I would like, it's, uh, we, we we have to really look at this problem and to look at it in a very serious way. Um, we have nowadays uh, 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 an information space that uh, is very much dependent uh, on, on the online platforms and it's completely suffocating the, the viability uh, and the sustainability of the media. Uh, and this is really very dangerous. So we need to 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 act, and we need to mobilize. Uh, we need to mobilize, of course. The the the, uh, and this is very clear in the joint declaration. The platforms really to have some uh, some clear orientations regarding the way uh, they um, the way they 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 behave, the way they um, they uh, are using. Uh, public of of uh, uh, content of public interest media content um and uh, to really look at it as something that they have to pay for which is not the case uh, uh, now or it, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's initiatives here and there in some countries with all the difficulties uh, you know we know uh, so Really, this is something we have to really to face and to face it very seriously. We need to uh, find a solution uh, to try to overcome uh, the, 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 the fragility, the, the increasing uh, fragility of uh, the media uh, sustainability. It's not possible. If we, have, uh, if we have media that are very fragile, uh, from uh, from uh, from the economic point of view, they will be easy prey of political interests, of business interests. They will not play uh, their role in our democratic societies. So we need this is very very serious, and we need to look at uh, the issue of uh, uh, of the of uh, the sustainability of the media sustainability. Um, uh, with 
all the with all the different uh, stakeholders, uh, with with the states, uh, with the platforms, with the media, and with the entire society, because it's Im important to raise awareness that uh, uh, you know that uh, all of us we we should really fight for uh, for it and and raise awareness and push the governments and push the the uh, the, the platforms in the sense uh, of really contributing to solve uh, the issue of uh, uh, of media sustainability it's 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 crucial if okay we, we are saying uh, media are are key to democracy but then they cannot do their work. They do not have the conditions. So this is a very serious issue. Thank you. Yeah. There's there's so much. I mean, the this topic itself could be an entire day long yeah. Yeah. conversation yes. and have been in, very in many different forms. But <laughs> but thank you for kind of really highlighting the centrality of the question and the need to kind of have a positive answer to that. Um, Pedro, if I could turn to you in terms of this, um, looking at this issue of recommendations beyond recommendations to the states. The joint declaration has some specific recommendations to the media industry itself, both in terms of ethical obligations and also the need to strengthen diversity in the industry, kind of move beyond. Diversity can obviously come in, in many different forms, but what are the recommendations for our colleagues working in the media and to media owners themselves and editors in this issue of what they should be taking out of this joint declaration? Thanks, Queen. I mean, being as a being a, a joint declaration user for several years. I mean, even before uh, being in this position, I think that one of the things that are very relevant and interesting is that the joint declaration it also offers some reflections and debates. So uh, when when we were discussing about uh, media freedom and democracy. Obviously, we, we we aim to protect this the, the sphere of media to 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 do to do their work, but also uh, it was undeniable that the expectation from media outlets is higher than that, um, and that's why, for example, you are going to find in this joint declaration uh, things relating with some who are inviting media outlets to strongly reject hate speech. We are inviting media uh, media outlets to be uh, part of the fight against discrimination. Uh, we are inviting uh, media outlets to uh, be part uh, or, or to be very far away, take distance from propaganda uh, for war and no amplify them uh, th that in in their media outlets. Uh, it also goes to the heart of. Uh, the invitation to media outlets to support human rights and democratic values. Uh, and it also goes straight to the point that media outlets should be, or we expect them to be as diverse as our societies. So it means we need uh, uh, to, to make the reflection around, uh, for example, the participation in, of women, the participation of different races, different religions, uh, uh, as 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 diverse is the society, that is the the standard of diversity that we expect from the whole media ecosystem. No, and 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 that also goes into national, uh, very local media outlets. Uh, pluralism it's a, it's very relevant here. Um, it is important to point out that uh, in the conversation of human rights, uh, women, migrants, refugees, stateless persons, victims of human trafficking and inter internally displaced, displaced persons, children and adolescents, human rights defenders, Afro-descendants, persons deprived of liberty, uh, LGBTI community, uh, persons with disabilities, elderly persons, all those are topics that are strongly related with, with human rights. And there's an invitation to media outlets to cover that, to, um, to, to, to analyze the, the, the quality standard of covering those issues. I mean, if we are in, 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 in a moment of our societies uh, in which there's a, a, a democratic decline and there's a backlash of human rights, we, we, we do not only need a free media, we also need the best 
coverage possible on those things. So it, it implies that the newsrooms are invited to analyze better ways to cover uh, uh, human rights issues. Um, then the, the, um, the, 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 the joint declaration also invites media outlets to reject hate speech. I mean, uh, to take explicit distance from hate speech uh, because of the, I mean, it's a non-protected speech at the international law, but also when those explicit distance and rejection are not clear, uh, people or, 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 or people that is damaging democracy uh, could take benefit from that no? and, and in this specific moment. So um, to conclude, uh, this instrument, we think, we expect, will serve as a guide to highlight the relationship between media and democratic values. It's not only the space to express, it's also the, the, the challenges of this specific moment that implies a, 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 a positive connection between media freedom, democratic values, and human rights. It's a really important point um, that you make, Pedro, because we see when we're talking about democratic decline in the world, one of the thrusts of that often comes with an increase of, of hate speech and the demonization of certain groups. That seems to be one of the defining features of authoritarianism is kicking kicking minority groups, kicking those who are more marginalized from society. So I think it's a really relevant and incredibly important point, making that connection explicitly in the joint declaration. Um, wanted to, we wanted to allow some space and time for questions from all of you who have come to join us. So if people have anything that they would like to, to ask the rapporteurs or about the declaration or some of the things more broadly that their, their mandates talk about, we'd be really welcome to hear any questions or comments that you might have. Um, yes, uh, and yeah, then yourself. So please go ahead. Share some insights from our region, from particularly from our context, like to to to. Uh, with the harmony from the international standard, the regional and the uh, state level. So, experience I would like to share um, in line with the democracy and media freedom. Uh, I'd like to share that uh, the insight from us is uh, we need to create a point decision maker to be um, participating in the democracy and successful or effective democracy. And media freedom is must, of course, in, in, in terms of that it comes up. And um, media and media freedom and information is being abused or weaponized um, one, uh, by one, one uh, issue is the media ownership that came up in the discussion that um, from Bangladesh, I could share, share, share with you that there is no law for uh, the selection criteria or any criteria for being a media owner. So the observation we have is the media is uh, not actually non-partisan. The information is being utilized from a political point, from the point of view, whether it is party or that's that party. So um, the audience, the uh, people, they're not getting the information as information. It is being politicized to some extent. Very recently, we have this um, uh, this uh, incident. We have a digital security act in Bangladesh that has been like legal instrument as a, and being abused like anything uh, for um, the huge uh, threat for media democracy, media information, and everything. And um, one of the editor of a, like um, a category um, like highest circulated uh, and accepted uh, newspaper, the editor was um, stood under the University Act along with a journalist. And a 
Article 19 D uh, protest against that. But one television station, they uh, they are also very much well accepted. They they, they organized a down television station where it was against like okay, it was only Article 19 represented along with another uh, legal expert who were defending against uh, the digital abusing the digital security act and attacking the uh, editor mm -hmm. but other than that whoever was there like they are high profile people representing legal um uh, expert representing media um the representation media houses print and electronic media and working for other CSOs. so these are like very systematic mechanism uh, to prohibit or to uh, threat the media figure that is what we are experiencing the other thing i would like to share is um about um protection law Pedro was saying like in bangladesh we do not have any protection direct protection law for the journalists for the communicators for whether it is like online or offline okay but uh, if you go for regional difference in pakistan uh, they have uh, two, I think, uh, in two continents, they have uh, two provinces, they have direct protection law for the journalists. And um, the reason I'm sharing about this is the international mechanism, it goes like top. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. So it's <laughs> the, the little mechanism that we take um, um, as a protection level, uh, protection uh, measure, it goes like state level, regional level, or international standard, we are referring that. So um, state level, okay, it is uh, like both ways, top, top, uh, top to bottom or bottom, up, uh, bottom down approach. So here we would like to approach and share that there is a need what we are doing in the state level is different thing, but here in the international fora, there is a need that there is international mechanism reference and which could be a must have requirement for the state level and regional level to have like uh, the selection criteria of the media owner, um, the uh, protection law protection mechanism, established protection mechanism for uh, journalists, communicators, because communicators, of course, of online and offline both, we cannot ignore uh, the situation that we depend on citizen uh, uh, journalists and the communication throughout the social media platform. And in line with that, yes, the um, the ethical journalists, journalism and uh, um, a responsible journalism comes up. So, Rim, Rim, yeah, I just want to make sure other people had a, a chance yeah. to. So thank you yeah. very much for the interventions. And yeah. I think they can follow up afterwards. Is there thank a specific? You. Actually, I think I'll I'll get back to this. I think there's a question in there that maybe I could direct to to you. But I wanted to have this gentleman then here and then and this gentleman over there so i'll take all the questions first and then we can see who's best you able to to kind of respond to this so please my name is mons blikabjerg or i'm representing the danish national Com commission uh, unesco commission uh, uh, i'm a vice chair and i'm um, also freelance on uh, 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 journalistic uh, lobbying and so on uh, i have to, i put i have one uh, comment on, uh, on on the paper support economic viability and sustainable sustainability of the independent media and, and the point a because when you talk about the stakeholders you talk about uh, governments the states the, the tech companies the media and remember always also to mention the journalists mm -hmm. uh, and and that's why i'm looking at point a here uh, a, a lot of good things mentioned but if you if you should not underestimate the need of a journalist to have decent working conditions mm. and decent payment, because without that, uh, it's it's not possible for journalists to do the job that they should do to be able to make the professional media, to be able that the media can uh, can contribute to democracy and all that. I th I think it's crucial to have it in this in your mind, also because it's not only about the journalist employed in the media; it's about a mm. lot of freelance journalists. We have so many freelance journalists now, yeah. and and you you really have to. Mm -hmm. uh, have a, a focus on those on those freelance journalists and then i, I shall be short and brief mm -hmm. the eu and the council of europe you should not underestimate what happens we have noticed the traffic coming from council of europe 
good recommendation uh, that are sent to the EU. And you see, in the last three, four years, we have seen more things happen in the EU than for decades. Uh, and I think we should have a more focus on this because we could use it being more, much more proactive. We have seen about the EMFA, how different media, they have different approaches to this instead of being collaborating mm -hmm. on how to um, mm -hmm. have a better EMFA out of it. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a point that you guys can elaborate a little bit on, particularly the issue of where you see kind of the freelance journalists kind of fitting into this. Irene, would you like to do this or should we take a couple more first? I, I wasn't going to respond to the freelance issue. You're right about freelance because the nature of journalism, the profession as a professional is, profession is changing uh, and, and uh, you're right on that. No, what I wanted to um, talk about was, first of all, yes, there is a lot of work going on in the European Union now uh, with the Digital Services Act, uh, the Media Freedom Act, the uh, they are now moving into um, the discussions about uh, artificial intelligence uh, act and so on. There's a lot of legislation going on there, but there is also a lot of gap between legis legislation that takes place in, the, in Brussels and what happens at the national level. Hungary is a good example. Poland on, on the issue of the rule of law and so on. So within the European Union, the mem we need to look at the member states and uh, not only at legislation uh, that is being uh, developed, but there is uh, uh, a realization within the European Union about the need for looking at what should be part of the internal market and what should be part of the common market. And, and in that context, I, I'm pleased that more attention is being given to the media, but there's a long way uh, between mm -hmm. those laws and what happens on the ground. The second point is that there is a lot happening in Europe. What worries me about the rest of the world and we need to be very careful that we do not become Eurocentric when it comes to human rights. They are universal. And the Digital Services Act of Brussels it, uh, may work, and I hope very much it will work for the European Union. It will not work for the rest of the world. So that is why we need to uh, broaden it out. I did want, want to point something when we talked about online and offline, that uh, while online, <laughs> we are getting more space to have free expression, the repression online is very severe. When uh, I have been an editor of one of the leading uh, of the leading English newspaper for a while in, in Bangladesh, I was a, a consulting editor there. I've worked as a journalist, um, and uh, you know this is a country where, for uh, a tweet, a 16-year-old can go to prison because he tweets about the prime minister. Uh, so you can imagine what happens to journalists. What we are seeing is that on the online space, the safety there is not just about attacks on journalists. It's about their freedom uh, to spread the word, punishment under the law. We've talked, we haven't talked about very much about criminalization, criminal libel, for example, has a more severe punishment when it is online than when it is in print. So those are, the, you know, the threats, uh, the nature of threats have increased enormously uh, in the digital sphere, while also empowering both journalists and citizens to speak out uh, mm -hmm. on, on the, uh, in the digital sphere. So that, that is a real threat, <laughs> that, yeah. which is why many people, when they go on television, will not criticize uh, anything, uh, even if they're leading figures in the country, don't dare say it. All right, we have several One, people here barbara i'm gonna we have over here first and then i believe this gentleman over there was second and then barbara i'm just gonna point to you to see who's coming uh, next after that so uh, the hi council my name of europe yes there. the council of europe in the in the back so <laughs> Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Marika Panadze. I represent, uh, I'm from the Republic of Georgia, representing a human rights organization, Georgian Democracy Initiative. Um, thank you, first of all, for this uh, great side event. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention on one, two particular issues from the Georgia. The first, that uh, the, the very sad thing that uh, uh, Georgia meets uh, the International Press Freedom Day uh, with the first, part, actually the, with the first uh, um, Prisoner, journalist, um, and media manager Nika Guaramia. I'm pretty sure, uh, especially Miss uh, uh, Teresa Niren, are, are familiar with this case. And uh, the another issue is about the, uh, the slap cases that are on the rise in Georgia. And sadly, um, what makes me sad is that uh, 
uh, Georgian case is not much visible anymore and is less discussed in the international uh, context. Uh, there are some other, like, of course, all the uh, countries need uh, particular attention, but that's why I also wanted to draw your attention to, to, to these particular issues. And I, I guess my question is whether you have been involved in an ad, any advocacy work with regard to release the Nicaguaramia and uh, what are your thoughts about the developments in Georgia? Thank you. All right, thank you. I'll take another question from the gentleman over there first, because I think you've been waiting and then maybe we can answer both together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The microphone's making its way over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Adetan Ojo. I am director of Media Rights Agenda in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, I have a somewhat very broad question. Uh, you've been doing this now for over 20 years. And I don't mean you personally, but your offices have been at this for quite a long time. And in that period, you've covered a variety of issues but I think perhaps the value uh, might be undermined by the fact that uh, this would be seen as advisories, perhaps. Are you contemplating any process of bringing all of these joint statements together after such a long period and perhaps codifying them? Because I think that there is an extra layer of benefit to the fact that this is coming from all of the mandates. It, it sort of standardizes um, any variations there may be in the different regions. And I think uh, really underscores the point that um, Irene made a short while ago that human rights are universal. So uh, the fact that all of you sit together and agree on standards, I think it's a huge value that should not be lost. Mm -hmm. So really the short summary of my question is, are you contemplating bringing all of these joint statements over two decades together and looking at a way of uh, codifying them so that um, uh, we sort of elevate the, the value that they can play uh, in the freedom of expression, media freedom landscape? Thank you. All right. Um, we'll take one more question and then we'll do some answers and then we'll do another round. All right. So. Uh, thank you. Maria Shaikas, um, Serbian journalist and media analyst. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Madame Khan and Ribeiro, for paying attention to Western Balkans. Uh, we are Europe, but the other Europe, as you said. Uh, brief question would be, what is the advice for media, uh, which is not part of the Europe, how to, uh, how to survive, how to, how to work in non-democracies? And then also, how will you measure the success of the declaration? Because for instance, Ms. Um, uh, Khan, you were recently in Serbia, you spoke with, uh, with our representatives, and I don't know what happened afterwards, like we didn't hear anything from them. Uh, and there was very little about your statement in our media because the media is very controlled. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So why don't we pause here that we had kind of three issues that were raised. One, our, our friend from Georgia had a question about kind of the advocacy around specific journalists for the release. We had a colleague in Nigeria say, suggesting that it'd be good to kind of codify all of the declarations over time. And is there any talk about that? And then one from Serbia, anyone like to address maybe the broad issue? Yeah, okay, very well. And, and also, and also the, the joint declarations, because you know, uh, the issue you are you are raising it's a very interesting one regarding the joint declaration. What should we do with this kind of a key of uh, you know of legacy? Uh, uh, and maybe we should go further and try to to uh, to to build something <laughs> uh, more consistent and clear to everyone. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, last year, precisely because um, we had all these years of joint declarations, uh, um, we, uh, we commissioned a study um, to, 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 to a professor to look, at, uh, to look at the joint declarations and to see um, what was the real impact of these joint declarations. Uh, of course, we have also to be very, uh, I would say, 
very aware that uh, our uh, our our constituency of those that look at these issues are, are limited. Unfortunately, we what can we do to 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 make them more uh, more um, well known and better used, etc. But one interesting conclusion: we had a set of recommendations also precisely to to uh, to make them uh, uh, to make them more visible in the media to in this uh, in the media community, etc. Um, but one interesting uh, issue that uh, one of the, the issues uh, that came out from this study was precisely that this is the important soft law tools. They are used um, by many uh, by many organizations, and they are also used uh, by the courts. And this is interesting. So it means that um, they have uh, there is an important value associated to uh, to this uh, to the joint declarations. But in any case, thank you. We will look again, and I think that uh, we all uh, would like very much. To, to, to give more visibility uh, to the joint declarations. And I'm sure mm -hmm. uh, we, we have to revisit the study we commissioned last year, uh, the OSC commission last year. And again, to try to, you know, to, to, to get them more visible and more uh, impactful in the media sector. Uh, regarding Georgia, it's true. It's true that unfortunately um, we are, slowly uh, witnessing a backsliding uh, uh, in the media sector. It's a pity. One of the problems is that uh, we are in a very, very political, um, polarized environment. Uh, media are very fragile and they are easy praise again of uh, political interest. So we are really in a crisis in, in, in Georgia, no doubt. Uh, um, uh, regarding uh, this uh, um, uh, this idea that uh, it's it's not it's not going well, unfortunately, it's not going well. Of course, I'm I'm engaging with the government. Uh, uh, you know, it's my work. Try to convince uh, for them to align their, their practices and uh, with uh, with international standards uh, with uh, OSCE. Um, media freedom commitments, and uh, I cannot give up. I will continue to do so. Thank you. Pedro, if I could ask you... But I think sorry, that, no, I'm uh, sorry, Jeremy, uh, please. Yes, let me start with Serbia. Um, I'm surprised you haven't heard anything because I gave a press conference in Serbia. I saw all the Serb... I don't read Serbo-Croat, but my colleagues uh, in, in Belgrade um, sent me uh, cuttings and other uh, news that came out. I was in Vojvodina television, as you know. Um, so yes, uh, <laughs> there was plenty of publicity on the ground. That is not the purpose of my country visit. The purpose of our country visit of the UN Special Rapporteurs is to have eventually a dialogue with the government. We meet a very broad uh, group of stakeholders. In Serbia, I met a whole range of journalists, uh, including some of your, um, what, what, what would I, how would I, uh, Happy TV, for example, you know what I'm talking about exactly. And I met with the CEO of Happy, Happy, uh, the chief editor in chief of the Happy, Happy TV. I met with all the independent outlets that are there. I met with individual journalists. I met at community level. I, when I went to Kosovo, I met the Albanian speaking media, as well as uh, Serbian speaking media. And uh, I gave my broad findings to the government and I gave my broad findings in the press conference. And then we had some publicity around that. But that is not the end of the story. I will now submit a report to the Human Rights Council. But there is a process to be followed because this is a serious dialogue with, with governments. This is not about a press release uh, and, yeah. and a two minute um, uh, interview on television. Uh, the idea is we put our recommendations down, we put our findings down, we send it to the government, the government comments on it if we get anything factually wrong. We are not obliged to accept the government's comments, but the government's comments are published alongside our report. Both go to the Human Rights Council, which is made up of 40 member states, who then uh, hold the government to account as well. They hold me to account as well. I have to explain what my 
conclusions are and the government is there to answer and there's a debate. And that takes place in the course of the year. It will be actually next year by the time it comes to the Human Rights Council. Mm -hmm. So please don't say you haven't heard it because you have. Uh, so there has been publicity. Uh, but the longer term change is going to come. On the question of codification and so on, uh, uh, of course, Teresa is absolutely right. What we see it as uh, developing a soft law, and that is our intention. But there is another very valuable um, uh, result of this. We are looking at regional standards and yeah. we are looking yeah. at universal standards. How do we uh, make sure that we among ourselves yeah. are actually bringing some coherence from the what's happening at the universal level and what's happening at the regional level. That's valuable. Secondly, we have tried to, to also educate governments through, through these uh, joint declarations. We, we, of course, have dialogues with governments. We educate civil society. So there is an awareness building that goes on. But where I would fully agree with you, sir, is I don't think the problem is codification. I think the problem is communication. Yeah. We need to make these documents more reader friendly, more user friendly, which is why we are having this kind of a discussion. And I think that is where responsibility, civil society has to take some responsibility as well. It is up to civil society, it's up to you to take these instruments and make them alive for people so that they can use it in their dialogue, in their everyday interaction. Thank you very much, Irene. And um, I just wanted to have, I think we have time for one more question. Sorry, the gentleman from the sorry, Council something. of Europe, it's, it's okay. Peter, actually, do you have something you'd like to add on this? Uh, sure, brief lecture. Was Please, go ahead. I mean, it's kind of a paradox that the question around the, the, the success of the joint declaration is made in 2023 because one of the purposes of this joint declaration was to collect. Was I mean, was not the, the process of codifying at that level, but to collect on what has been said around media and democracy. So uh, I would invite you all to double check if that, I mean, goal was rich or not, no? but 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 it was part of our of our talks at, at the beginning. Then I think it's really hard to to monitor the success of the joint declaration as a process because there are different mandatory holders. These are positions that change. Um, also, I think at least in the region I follow in the Americas, it depends, for example, on the political will of some states. I remember, for example, the 2013 declaration on protest and journalistic coverage. That was a very successful joint declaration in, in the region I follow. I mean, even judiciary decisions, uh, reports from the commission have uh, quoted that, that joint declaration. And, and then I think there's another conversation overlap, and I think this is a great audience to, to, to open that space. You know? um, and it's which are the gaps and the lack, because there's an expectation that this declaration is going to cover a specific issue on a financial situation of journalism. Should we be considering a, a specific joint declaration on, on that? For and, and I think that the role, I mean, probably is because of the pandemic, probably is because of where we, with our heads in a lot of times simultaneously, but I would invite civil society to ask the different topics that you think should be developed in future joint declarations. No, because at this specific moment, it's very hard for a, for a, um, a, a document that wants to be short, but deep, and wants to cover the whole world and the specific situation of the regions. Uh, so probably media sustainability is not here, but I would like you to know that it's something we are discussing. No? And then to codify that at like as a, as a I don't know like 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 um, the history and I mean the, the the main achievements of the joint declaration. I think it also depends on partners as UNESCO. No? Um, and I hope that I mean probably next year in Chile uh, we could have more time, for example, in the agenda to get in deep uh, to, to to explain a little bit the process of of the joint declaration because <laughs> at the end we are <laughs> out of time to share with you what is behind a text that and 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 and, and you also are out of, I mean we're, we're going to wrap up this this conversation yeah. very soon uh, but it would be very interesting to to have a feedback of what is I mean where's the lack of of, of reflection because later on we're going to have the the conversation on which I mean which is the frame of the next joint declaration 
No. So I, I think there's a communication process not between us and the whole society. I think the, there's a communication process that we have to fix among the community that follows freedom of expression. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are actually at time right now. And I know that there's other events that are going on and people, yeah. Pedro, I know you have to go to another event. So do I. Yes, Teresa, you have to go to another event. Yeah. So unfortunately, we've run out of time for questions. Please do seek people out. But if you had each of you just a really quick 30 second reflection, where do you what would you want people to take away from this declaration in terms of working with you? What are you taking forward in terms of your own advocacy off the back of this? Um, Pedro, can we start with you? No, I mean, 30 seconds to to open the space to receive. I mean, suggestions on, on which issues should be covered. No? Uh, at, I mean, and, and I'm sure that's a, uh, something that is willing the, 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 by all the mandates here. Thank you very much. Teresa. Yes, uh, just to, to, to also to reinforce what Pedro said and to create a more interactive process uh, 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 in, the, in the preparation of the joint declarations. It's really a good idea. Um, uh, the joint declarations are already a collaborative process uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with civil society, but we need to enlarge it. And for that, we need time because it's, uh, you know, it's uh, all, already difficult to try to harmonize all the different ideas, all the different uh, uh, positions uh, between the four mandate holders. Uh, and so we have to be realistic. Uh, um, if we are enlarging the process too much to civil society, we need time and we need to structure a process that can really work. Otherwise, it will be just cacophony and it will be uh, a difficult, uh, uh, a difficult way of preparing a joint declaration. Let's be realistic, which I think that uh, it's important too. Uh, in terms of the joint declaration, I would say uh, we have, of course, worked on this with Article 19 for the, yeah, since yeah. Uh, the beginning, yeah. and uh, perhaps Article 19 should take a kind of a convening role with civil society yeah. and. We, yeah. on our, from our side, see Article 19 in that role that you are bringing to us, not just the views of Article 19, one organization, but the general view, the broad uh, concerns or interests of uh, civil society. And I would encourage you to continue to play that role here. Uh, from our side, I, I would also ask you, those of you who had enough interest on an on a early morning to uh, turn up here and to listen to us and others who are listening to us uh, in other fora, to take these joint declarations. Their value only lies to the extent that you yeah. use them. So please take them, read them, use them, uh, convert them into more user-friendly forms if you find it useful, and spread them around so that you know our, our wisdom gets, goes broader than this uh, document here. As far as media freedom is concerned, having worked myself as an as a, uh, editor uh, in, in a very difficult uh, media situation, I think uh, it's, it's a very valuable role. We need to understand that. Uh, unlike teachers, just like teachers, I think, we do not value our journalists. And I think we need to learn to value them. Um, and journalists need to value their own profession and live up to their ethical and journalistic mm -hmm. standards. Public trust in journalism is at an all-time low. And we all need to ask why and take responsibility for that. And I hope this declaration will generate uh, some more debate about what's going wrong and what responsibility each of us have to set it right. Okay. Thank you very much to, to all of you. Some good calls to action for all of us here in the room and to the sector more broadly. Thank you to those who have joined us today, to the New York Bar Association and the Vance Center for, for hosting this event. Um, please do feel free to reach out to the rapporteurs. I think you may have a couple minutes before you go to your next events. I'm not sure, but um, it's been really lovely having this dialogue, and we look forward to taking it forward thank as well. Thank, thank you, Queen. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, thank yeah. you. That's thank you all. That's Thanks, it. everyone. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, any business card with me, but uh, you know, I have all the Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And then, I know. So, when Yes, I have. I will make a draft. I will share the draft with the Dutch government. They, they, they respond. They respond. My report goes out on the other side. And the discussion. Oh, right. so, 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 look up yes. Hungary and see if all there in the public domain. There is a UN um, number on in the reporting there for posterity. So I have a picture. Yeah. Because, because we have to come to the Hungary and you see the same as this. So Okay, Irene. I mean, just for a second. Sorry, one second. Yeah. One second, just for the photo, because we have to run. Sorry, I mean, I think we did, uh, but I couldn't. I can't be absolutely sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. You know, I, I, I see. Hello, everyone. Just oh, very okay. briefly, if I can make a comment for anybody who wants to stick around. Uh, we have another session starting at 11.30 here in the same room on how to build a healthier online environment. Um, in the meantime, in the back on the left, you can help yourself to some coffee or tea. Um, and we hope to see you in 25 minutes in this room again. Thank you. Just really, really quickly, Topsy did um, text me. She was just, I think, stuck somewhere and couldn't uh, make okay. it. She asked if she could come, but it was already like 10 30 by the time okay. she said, so she couldn't really get over here meeting. Okay, we right. right. understand. It's yes. busy um, days. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs>
So are you um, meaning the next one, one, one you mean the one around the OSCE? We can, we yeah. can set up a video call. Yeah, yeah. Guatemala, so, yeah. And, yeah. Guatemala and Honduras. Okay? Thank you. Guatemala and Honduras. Because yeah. 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 I mean, we can go together. You really have to get that ecosystem where the people can kind of speak the truth of their living and ensure that it's better. But if it's not necessarily not the right thing to do, I thought it was interesting yesterday the day before they had like the contents with the Brazilian having interfacing with the laws, how it's impacted them trying to create and generate their own internet. So there's the events now, and then isn't there another one? Yes. No, I'm at another event. It's like, I'm going to go there and see. I know the Spanish to be dangerous. There's a general, I think, that's part of the problem with a lot of the regulations. It, it, it's one of those interesting issues where the only way that I 
How are you doing? Yeah, it's 
I'm just a, like 10 minutes. Hello, everyone. Uh, just a short point of information. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but we will start in about 10 minutes. And for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to grab some tea or coffee in the back room um, to, the, to, to your right, there's some tea, coffee, water. Please help yourselves. Um, and hope to see you again in. in yeah, in 10 minutes, we should be ready to start. Thank you. Right. 
Hello, Denise, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? No. Are you Washington. Washington. Yeah, so I just got off last night. So I did back tomorrow, uh, tonight. Right. Yeah. You're, you're NYC based, right? I am for now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in just a minute. So, if I can ask everybody to 
take their seats and then we can begin very, very soon. Thank you. So good morning and almost good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I would like to begin by introducing myself and, and our speakers. Um, first, my name is Denise Wagner. I'm an advisor to the OSCE representative on freedom of the media, and I'll be moderating this session. Um, and then we have the honor and pleasure to, um, of having both the OSCE representative on freedom of the media to my far right, Teresa Ribeiro, and the UNESCO Assistant Director General for Communication and Information, Mr. Tofik Jalasi, who will be giving introductory remarks to frame our discussion today. And then we'll hear from our expert panelists to my left. We have Robin Kaplan, a senior researcher at Data and Society, uh, Catalina Moreno on the, on the far end, uh, project coordinator and researcher for the Charisma Foundation in Colombia, and then Daniel Omari, or Dan Omari, um, who's a senior digital governance specialist at the Center for International Media Assistance of the National Endowment Democracy, for Democracy. And then finally, after the discussion, we have Adeline Hulan hiding and waving in the back, who will wrap up our event with some closing remarks um, and bring it, bring all of the discussions together. Um, so first, before I go into any detail, I'd like to start off um, by giving the floor to uh, our two um, expert introducers who will help sort of shape uh, and, and frame our discussion for today. So without further ado, Teresa Rivero, if I can ask you to first take the floor and give us a brief introductory remarks. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. And again, uh, it's a great pleasure to address you today uh, at this World Press Freedom Day side event that we have the pleasure of organizing with our, our dear colleagues uh, uh, at UNESCO and uh, very especially with uh, uh, my dear friend uh, um, <clears throat> Tarfik Celasi on how to build a healthier online information ecosystem to ensure access to public interest content uh, online. Today, we find ourselves at the crossroads. The media ecosystem has witnessed and continues to witness a period of enormous transformation. Remarkably, much of this transformation has crept up on us silently, despite penetrating every inch of our lives. So we are left with a situation that allows us only to be reactionary. But we must do more than just react. We need far-sighted, visionary proposals that go beyond reacting to the arms, but also provide a vision of what a healthy online information ecosystem should be. On the one hand, Digital technologies have really helped increase access to information across the globe and in real time. In many ways, it has enabled an active citizenry like never before. Global movements on key questions of our time are being coordinated through information flows online. And media actors, whether they are new anchors, news anchors, journalists, bloggers, or anyone else reporting about history taking place, have digital platforms where they can speak up, sometimes with the necessary protection of anonymity. However, at the same time, the media ecosystem is marred by economic hardship, information disorders, gatekeepers of information, that do not put public interest at the heart of their business models, a lack of internet regulation, and unfortunately, the list goes on. Not to mention that public interest information is quite often overshadowed 
by all kinds of less critical, irrelevant, or even harmful content due to the engagement rates this type of content receives. Some of these challenges deeply affect the key pillars of democracy and the entire fabric of modern society. Our joint declaration, which uh, was discussed in this room earlier today, points to exactly this, the critical role of media freedom and democracy. And it provides detailed recommendations for various stakeholders on how to ensure media can play their role in democracy. To this end, states are given a set of recommendations on how to best uphold their, uh, the, their, uh, uh, their positive obligations to promote, protect, and create an enabling environment for media freedom. And online platforms are urged to comply with international human rights standards, establish meaningful transparency, strengthen user agency, engage in periodic human rights impact assessments, and design robust remedy mechanisms, among other things which are detailed in our uh, joint declaration. Indeed, we find ourselves at the crossroads. By now, we have seen and witnessed the impact of harmful online content, such as lies, disinformation, hate speech, and even state-sponsored information campaigns can have on the individual, societal, and global level. We have to ensure that the global online information ecosystem is beneficial to individuals, human rights, and our collective democratic values and principles. Indeed, the question of how to best protect freedom of expression, media freedom, and access to public interest content in the online information ecosystem is highly complex, and it requires a whole of society approach. We also need to strengthen international coordination and cooperation as there is no simple or one-size-fits-all solution. UNESCO's initiative to develop global guidance for regulating digital platforms is therefore a very important and timely endeavor. We need such global, multilateral, okay. and multi-stakeholder processes to safeguard freedom of expression, access to information, and other human rights and we need leadership. There is no doubt that the states have an important role to play in safeguarding our rights online, and in some cases, developing regulation to this end. But this does not mean that the states should use this situation as a carte blanche to further restrict and censor the media online, as we see in some cases. Rather, states should focus on regulating the processes that are used to spread and amplify harmful content over media and public interest content. In other words, they need to regulate which, not speech. Finally, I also want to emphasize that any response must be centered in human rights and in the public interest. Part of the solution will also require a reassessment of the excessive power that a handful of online platforms maintain over the information and media landscape. We need to counterbalance the infrastructural dependency of media on these large online platforms. I'm grateful for the excellent speakers who have joined us today to give deeper to dive deeper into addressing these existential challenges we face today. I hope this event will bring fruitful and forward-looking discussions and hope we can further engage and join efforts to attain a healthier online information ec ecosystem to ensure access to public interest information. Thank you very much.
evening. Thank you very much, Teresa. And uh, from from what you've said, we I think we all sense the urgency around uh, these uh, global issues that need also uh, global responses and solutions. And we're we're very happy also um, uh, in the OSCE that we work very closely together with UNESCO on such initiatives. And it's important that international organizations um, collaborate and cooperate on these type of efforts. Um, UNESCO, as Teresa has already mentioned, is working on a global guidance on uh, addressing um, ways to regulate online content management practices, but many other initiatives, of course, the OSCE has worked on um, a policy manual uh, addressing the impact that AI has on freedom of expression. And I'm really pleased that we get to work together the highest levels, as you can see, but also in the working level. And it's really a pleasure um, to have you, Mr. Jalassi, here with us as well today um, to address our audience, to address all of us on, on these important issues. So with that, I'd like to give you the floor, Mr. Jalassi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear colleague and friend, Teresa Ribeiro, distinguished speakers, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to wish you all happy World Press Freedom Day. We are May 3rd, we should not forget that. And this is the World Press Freedom Day. And I would like to welcome you to this special event organized in this context. I recognize many faces in the audience who joined us yesterday at the United Nations General Assembly Hall for the official day to celebrate the 30 year anniversary of the World Press Freedom Day. Some of you were with us last evening. UNESCO awarded last night the 2023 World Press Freedom Prize, which is officially called the UNESCO Guillermo Cano World Press Freedom Prize. The laureates of this year, in case you haven't heard about the outcome of that ceremony, the laureates are three imprisoned women journalists in Iran. This award for 26 years running is given by an international and independent jury to journalists who have persisted, persevered with their mission to inform the world about what's happening on the ground, who have showed a lot of courage, especially in the face of a great danger. And over these 22 year, 26 years, the prize went to individuals, associations, or institutions who have met the criteria. So on this day, we are here, journalists, media professionals, and officials who are also joining forces with you, not only to defend, but also to promote freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and to safeguard the safety of journalists. The objective over the last three decades remains unchanged, but the environment in which media operates today has changed a lot. As Teresa Ribeiro referred to, the new ecosystem for information and communication today has nothing to do with the one of Windhoek 1991, when UNESCO organized the very first event on this subject matter. <coughs> UNESCO mission from 78, mandate, UNESCO's constitutional mandate from 78 years ago, that is 1945. The mandate was to promote the free flow of information by word and image. Word in reference to radio programs, audio programs, image in reference to visual, audiovisual programs. Today, of course, we can add by digital as well. Teresa talked quite a bit about the importance of digital platforms and social media in this new information media ecosystem. And also Teresa referred to a recent initiative of UNESCO taken last year entitled Internet for Trust, 
and the base, the objective of which is through an inclusive multi-stakeholder process to draft guidelines to regulate the digital platforms as to ensure that information is a common public good, that information is not a public hazard, nor a harmful side to individuals and to societies. So in this new media ecosystem, increasingly digital, of course, there are new challenges that you are all aware of. Misinformation, disinformation, hate, hate speech online, cyberbullying, conspiracy theories, and so on and so forth. The harmful content on these platforms has grown exponentially over recent years. And the essence of this UNESCO initiative is to say, we cannot stay passive in the face of this harmful content. We have to do something together. The technology companies that operate these platforms, the 193 member states of the UN and of UNESCO, but also civil society organizations, academia, research institutions, and the technical community in order to hopefully contribute to a freer and safer digital ecosystem. Today's event co-organized by UNESCO and the OSCE representative on freedom of the media is in the framework of the two institutions projects. On the OECE part, the Spotlight on Artificial Intelligence and Freedom of Expression project, called for short, SAFE, S-A-I-F-E. And on the UNESCO side, our Social Media for Peace project, which has been running for some time now and has been funded by the European Union. <laughs> This brings us to discuss a key issue. How can we promote access to public interest information for users on social media by maximizing the benefits of the platforms while diminishing the spread of harmful content and protecting freedom of speech online? This is the balancing act. This is where the complexity is. Because when we say how to regulate, of course, nobody should understand how to censor the platforms. We want to regulate to combat the harmful content while safeguarding freedom of speech. And that's, I think, our shared objective here. Less than a decade ago, social media became clearly a strong new force to democratize knowledge and information. But we saw the fundamental, change, change, uh, the fundamental change taking place, which is very much of economic nature, because the harmful content in part can be understood or can be thought of coming from the very core economic model of the digital platforms. What creates buzz online? Is it more fake news or is it fact-checked information? What people share and like and disseminate? Of course, in the traditional media, there is an editorial office. There is an editor which makes sure that what goes to print is fit. But where is the editorial office online? Where is the newsroom online? Of course, for professional media organizations, they have that. I'm not disputing that. But today, online, it's not, there, is, there are not only professional media and journalists. There are many quasi-journalists. Again, whether you say it, uh, bloggers or people running wikis or whatever it is. So what I'm saying, the democratization is good in one side, but it has a negative side to it. There is no systematic, thorough fact-checking before the information the, before the, the information gets disseminated and people who like and share 
become themselves the relays of misinformation and disinformation. And then back to the economic model, the more clicks, the more revenues for the digital platforms. Because today, of course, the more clicks you mean, the more personal data you can gather, you can collect, which is the basis of online advertising. So more, the more clicks, the more advertisers. And the more advertisers, the more revenues. And the more revenues, the more profits. So again, uh, there is that side of the equation that we should all be aware of. And that's why we made sure at UNESCO, when we kicked off our initiative a year ago, that the technology companies that operate these digital platforms are an integral part of our initiative, of our multi-stakeholder process. Because without them, we may come up with a declaration and not more. But if you want these principles, these guidelines to be implemented and to be impactful, we need desperately to have the technology companies on board because they own the platforms, they operate the platforms. Let me quote Maria Ressa in the UNESCO Global Conference this past February on the Internet for Trust. And she said, on the digital platforms, lies travel much faster than truth. And this is a fact of life. It's a fact of life. On digital platforms, lies travel much faster than truth. And truth becomes almost a second class, second category of information. But the, what catches the eyeballs is again, the buzz, the not necessarily checked information, not the fact-based content. And we have seen a global discontent about these developments. And this is continuing, of course. I mean, there is a lot of talk about the Twitter of today compared to the Twitter of a year ago. But not only this platform, about other platforms as well. And how can we, again, make it an inclusive, participatory process, especially when it comes to content moderation and content curation, and when it comes to the type of algorithms that are used for the content moderation, how unbiased they are and how sensitive they can be to different languages, to different cultural context, to different uh, regions of the world. I think this is also extremely important. I think what I briefly mentioned was highlighted by the research conducted within the EU funded Social Media for Peace project, which UNESCO has piloted in four target countries, Kenya, Indonesia, Colombia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. It's a fact that most content moderation resources are allocated or have been allocated to a very limited number of countries around the world. Let me give you an example. Almost 90% of Facebook resources for fighting misinformation goes to only English speaking countries. 90% goes to only one language of the world. You know how many languages are in the world? Over 8,000. Of course, I'm not saying that all of them are spoken to the same extent. But we know at least the UN has six official languages spoken by hundreds of millions or billions of people. 90% of Facebook resources regarding fighting misinformation are allocated only to English speaking countries. These countries represent only 9% of Facebook users. So we see the disproportion here. You see the disproportion here. In Kenya, we have seen that content moderation is conducted mainly in English and Swahili. Although harmful content exists in over 60 minority languages. So I'm highlighting the language divide, if I can call it that way. 
quite often we talk about the digital divide and we talk about a knowledge divide, but there is also a language divide that not only you have to be aware of, but we have to do something about it. A second finding from the UNESCO Social Media for Peace project is how much media and journalists, which are now increasingly relying on social media for their distribution, have been impacted by this algorithmic content curation and moderation. We have collected several examples of media and journalist accounts being blocked or their visibility being downgraded for months, sometimes even years, although they were reporting on issues of public interest. So what I'm saying, it's not only the language matter, but there is another matter. It's not, it goes online or it does not. But how does it go online? Is it instant? Is it delayed by days, by months, by years? And then where do you find it online? Is it at the, on screen one or screen two of a search? Or is it at the bottom of the 30th screen of a search results? So again, it's not only black or white. We can see variations in the way of moderating and curating content. I would like to state here that the principle of freedom of expression is also the right to seek and receive information. This is formally defined as such. It is formally defined as such. Freedom of expression is also the right to receive and seek information. And this right is directly infringed when social media algorithms actively promote misleading or hateful content in order to increase user engagement as explained before for economic reasons. So what is the conclusion from this? Social media prevent sometimes verified public interest information from getting disseminated and distributed. At UNESCO, we believe that the regulation of online platforms could be a powerful tool for preventing this. But we must, of course, get it right because of the complexity I mentioned before. Based on our research, 55 countries have issued or are in the process of issuing national legislation to address the spread of harmful content online. The worrisome part here is that these national legislative efforts risk infringing on freedom of expression. And this is why, again, we have taken this bold initiative, this daring initiative called Internet for Trust, with the different stakeholders I mentioned, and very much, and here I refer to what Teresa said in her speech, our approach is not only inclusive, multi-stakeholder based, it is also based on international human rights law. That is our compass. This is at the heart of the matter. And there will be no compromise on this matter. Do I need to uh, stop talking? <laughs> I see a piece of paper being circulated. <laughs> but you know, Adeline, uh, I used to be a university professor. So a professor knows when to start speaking, but doesn't know necessarily when to end the speech. Yeah. All right, so let me go to the conclusion then. All right. <laughs> Two sentences and I'll stop. The bottom line, we need to work together to protect and promote access to public interest information. We have to ensure that media can bring such information to users, including on social media platforms. I hope that the next presentations and the debate that will happen be fruitful, 
informative and useful for all of us. And let me close by reminding you that between now and Friday, there will be 20 additional sessions as part of the WordPress Freedom Conference celebration. So stay in this session at the end and then check the website to know what is next and what event you may want to attend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ADG and Professor Jalassi. Um, this was a very, very uh, helpful and an informative introduction, I think, particularly to shape our discussion that we will have now. And uh, thank you so much also for focusing on really these aspects of content moderation and content curation practices, which we will dive into a little deeper and the notion of uh, access to public interest information. This is really at the heart of the question we are here to address. How do we ensure that information is a public good, becomes a public good online and is not manipulated in ways that make it a hazard for societies? Um, and it's also very welcoming that we have had this focus of looking forward. And I really want during this session to take this step forward. And what do I mean by that? I'd like us to go a little bit beyond um, the usual focus that we've heard a lot about in the past, and, and of course is still an important issue that needs to be discussed on mitigating the harms of new technologies, but also um, to look at and identify ways to build new norms, new policies that are positively conducive to our digital rights and information ecosystems. So not just what should we prevent online, but what do we want an online information space to really look like that is helpful for our societies. Um, for the protection of our individual rights, but also collectively um, for societies as a whole. I won't go into much detail. We've heard a lot already, so I don't need to um, further frame any of the discussion, but I'd like to immediately actually jump right um, to our wonderful experts who I've introduced at the beginning. Um, how do we empower individuals and societies in, in a democratic context? Um, how can we ensure that, inform, uh, that people are informed on issues of public interest online um, in order to promote an active citizenry that strengthens, of course, ultimately democracy, peace and stability that are important um, aspects of the mandates that both of these organizations, OSE and UNESCO, advocate for. Um, so let me turn to you, Robin, if I may. Um, we've heard from both um, the UNESCO ADG and the OSE RFOM um, and I feel a sense of urgency from these introductions. The situation we find ourselves in is already deeply problematic. And you've been researching these issues for, for many years, yeah. um, particularly the impact that the, this online information ecosystem um, is having on our societies. And so what has happened? Maybe you can give us a little bit of a, a perspective of having researched over the years. What's happened? Um, and what is the impact that we're witnessing around the world today compared to, as we have heard in 1991 during Windhoek, where the media landscape looked completely different? Mm. Um, what, are, what are the challenges we're, we're grappling with? Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay. So I'm an interesting person in this debate because I think we're often overly optimistic in how we talk about technologies. And I also think we're overly pessimistic in how we think about technologies. So I think that when we're talking about and trying to draw kind of clear differences between the media environment that existed in the 1990s and the media environment that existed today, we're often kind of overemphasizing the difference without realizing how one builds off of another. Um, I have been working on these issues for a very long time. Data and Society, um, got a grant back in 2015 called Who Controls the Public Sphere in an Era of Algorithms? Um, I was um, the person kind of poised to take up the grant. I was the only person that had a media studies background. At the time, I was working on issues related to open data and policing, and I swore to myself I was not going to let this issue completely divert all of my work because it is complicated and messy and it might have no clear right answer. Um, and lo and behold, since that time, this is all I've been working on. So during that project, what we 
were doing was that we were trying to um, pick up on a bunch of little strains that had been happening in academia up until that point of a bunch of different academics kind of working in their separate corners talking about what might happen as more and more communication flows onto centralized media ecosystems. Uh, we got together a group of scholars. Um, I was actually working on my qualifying exams at the time for my PhD, and I ended up basing my qualifying exams around this. It was incredible. They basically invited everybody I was reading into the room, and it was like having like kind of a live literature review, uh, which was a wonderful experience. But we put together a set of case studies that kind of looked at the worst case scenario. What is the worst case scenario of what can happen as more institutions and organizations and individuals converge onto these spaces? Um, we looked at issues related to, you know, the impact of um, social media on newsrooms. We looked at the potential for state-sponsored disinformation, which was around at that time and was being talked about in, in little bits. Um, and we, uh, in a range of other issues. Uh, we kind of came out of that conversation being like, okay, well, these are problems for the future, but they might not be problems for tomorrow. And the very next day, you know, basically all of these problems came to a head. What I have seen in the last few years is a really kind of, is a real ebb and flow in terms of how we need to be thinking about these issues. And I'm a little bit concerned about where we are at now versus where we were at a couple of years ago. So we had this period where, you know, nobody was really talking about these issues. We started this project. Donald Trump gets elected, elected Brexit happens, and suddenly the world starts talking about social media and the impact of social media. I have seen over the last several years, social media companies kind of respond to this in a variety of ways. In some ways, we started to see some kind of meaningful, more meaningful and less meaningful kind of attempts to share power um, through engaging a lot with civil society actors. Um, I saw some kind of meaningful pushback through things like the DSA and through things like news media bargaining codes and through things like um, users online who were coordinating together to push back against these platforms as well. And what I'm concerned about right now is that we're actually entering into a decline again <laughs> um, in terms of how these platforms think about their responsibility. I, my friend Kate Klonick wrote a piece recently uh, in which she said that we may realize um, a little bit from now that we're actually, we had our heyday of platforms acting responsibly over the last few years. And what I mean is that within the last little bit, we've started to see platforms really step back. Uh, we've started to see them cut off access to researchers um, in a variety of different ways. We have seen them literally privatize themselves so they wouldn't um, have to um, be accountable um, to the public any longer. Um, we have seen them use a, a, an economic moment to cut staff, um, particularly within trust and safety, um, that was really argued for and really kind of hard, um, which was a really hard one fight. Um, so what I am concerned about right now is that we've seen this real ebb and flow in terms of how we think about power and platforms. We had kind of a meaningful period of pushback and now we're starting to see them kind of pull back into their corners and start to make the same mistakes that they made in the past media era with things like generative AI, where they're deploying this stuff without any sort of meaningful consultation about what this could mean for a variety of different stakeholders. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm going to send it back to you so I don't talk too long. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Robin, um, for this. And, and um, you've mentioned it's a very interesting phenomenon that, that you mentioned in terms of how there's this wave of initiatives, particularly regulatory ones. You mentioned the Digital Services Act in the European Union. Um, and, and, and interestingly, this pushback or this shutting off from platforms for, for more access. And we'll get into that in, in in a, in a second round of questions, I certainly want to dig a little bit deeper into sort of what is happening in the regulatory space mm -hmm. um, and, and what that means in terms of positive or negative impact it can have on um, bringing more responsibility to platforms in their practices. But before we do, we heard a lot about also this notion of media. And, and I think it's important to maybe frame who and what we're talking about, because we've also heard a lot about the changing media landscape, how much has changed in terms of who are the actors in this information ecosystem? Who are the gatekeepers? Who are the editors to our information? What kind of information? So a lot of a lot of questions there. Dan, you've been researching a lot um, in this area. So I, 
I think it'd be really interesting to hear from you if you could speak a little bit to this notion of quote unquote media, um, which seems perhaps obvious, but has been become blurred over, over the years um, with the shifting uh, landscape and the challenges that we face that we've heard. Um, access to the media has changed online. Trust has diminished, as we've heard. Many are struggling with financial sustainability and the list goes on. So maybe you can give us a little bit of an overview. Who are we talking about and what are the challenges they're facing? Yeah, great. Thank you, Denise. And, and thank you to the OSCE and, and UNESCO for organizing this really important panel. These issues on AI and journalism and algorithmic governments or governance are something that we've been paying attention to a lot at SEMA over the past, you know, I'd say five or six years. We're housed at the National Endowment for Democracy, which is primarily a grant-making institution. And in 2022, the National Endowment for Democracy gave around $50 million in grants to um, about 480 different organizations in 82 countries. And so, you know, uh, when we're thinking about media, we're thinking a lot about largely small independent media in um, emerging democracies, developing countries, even in closing spaces. And the reason, and, and this 50 million is out of a total of, you know, 350 million that we give as, as, as grant funding. So it's a really significant amount. And I think it speaks to the power of our belief that, uh, you know, independent media is critical for democracy. And I think that's what we're all kind of here. You know, how do we deal with these two overlapping crises? One, the crises in uh, media sustainability, and now layered on top of that, I would say since November 2022 with Chat GPT, this you know this uh, impending fear about what does this technological change, generative AI, what does it mean, right? And what does it mean for people who the news, which is in, in general a kind of content production, right? And so therefore these crises, but these you know these types of media are the ones that we think about the most, and the ones that I think where we feel like the most analysis needs to be done because oftentimes the media that are based in the US or Europe have resources to advocate for themselves. Obviously the data sets that these new algorithms are being built on are coming from those uh, places, right? So the, the, the biases are less, but what about, um, you know, for example, uh, just actually last week we had, obviously the situation in Sudan is deteriorating. We support a number of news outlets in Sudan um, in Sudan, because of the media restrictions, Facebook is actually one of the ways that people have access to independent media. So as much as, you know, as much as we have challenges with the social media companies and, and the, the trend they're going on, they're still very important. And one of the websites, their Arabic uh, uh, website on, 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 well, I won't say a platform, but, you know, was, uh, uh, had basically been kind of sy systemically attacked and therefore it was kind of not getting reaching an audience right and the the news outlet didn't know how to they tried the different methods to try and like contact the company to see what could be done and nothing was done um fortunately we had you know this channel to me we have connections with some of the trust and safety people at, at this organization and they were able to address the situation but ultimately if you think about what happened this it was, was a, a, a result of um you know, automatic uh, content moderation in Arabic, which is not as precise as it is in English or some of the other dominant languages, right? So if you think about it, this is ultimately a question of these types of AI and journalism. These news outlets that are covering things, especially in a really fast moving news environment in Sudan where people are trying to get news and information is so incredibly important. And so that speaks to the challenge that we face. I think that, um, all like all tools, there's going to be a lot of benefits from generative AI, but there's a lot of challenges and we're, we're seeing a lot of these challenges right now. But um, I think the conversation for me is trying to think about those, um, you know, those what, you know, some people have made a ecological, the keystone species of newsy outlets, the independent media outlets that are fundamental for democracy. And I think that's who we're thinking about. And we want to think about what are the implications for this technological transformation on that ecosystem, particularly. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, in, incredibly uh, interesting research that you've done and, and, and the work that SEMA does in supporting media is also um, absolutely crucial. Uh, and and you've, you've mentioned, I mean, independent media is critical for democracy. And how do we deal with these overlapping crises? You've mentioned too, I think we can add on a few more even. Um, before I move on to Catalina, I'd just like to very briefly thank our introductory speakers. I know it's uh, 
as Mr. Jalassi mentioned, a busy day with lots of different side events and meetings. So thank you so much for your introductory remarks. I know that you'll have to leave very soon. So I just wanted to um, briefly take this moment to, to, to thank you. And, and um, with that, move on to our third uh, speaker on our panel, um, after which I do want to open the floor. I have lots of questions here, but I don't want to monopolize. I'm just sort of facilitating this discussion. So I'd like to, to already think ahead. If you have any questions or comments, please join, join this discussion. Um, but we've heard, Catalina, we, going back to the introduction on content moderation and content curation practices, maybe just to take a step back um, towards these uh, different um, content governance structures. Um, I wanted to ask you, you've researched a lot about specifically what content moderation and content curation does more on the national and local levels um, outside of countries like the US or English speaking countries, particularly in your case in Colombia. Um, and how, how it impacts the visibility and access to news media and public interest content. Um, I know you've worked a lot with UNESCO in researching this area. So maybe you could give us a little bit of uh, um, um, in, insight into your research um, and then we'll dig into elements and, and I'm sure I'll have some follow-up questions based on, based on your findings. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Yeah, we've, we've made a lot of researches. Um... Right now, just like you were saying, like the entry barrier to um, post content is low. So a lot of people, I mean, there's a de democratization power behind social media. A lot of people can produce uh, content even outside of the, of the central areas of our country. But what we've seen is um, uh, even though there's this democratization power behind social media, the reach uh, is intermediated by algorithmic decisions. These decisions are not, um, are not so transparent for social uh, civil society or for independent media, and that's what we found. These people in Colombia, in informal conversations mainly, have said to us that their content gets, uh, it, it is uh, demoted or it is removed because of political uh, content inside this, this posting, and they don't know what to do. I mean, these decisions are not transparent. The mechanisms in order to appeal them are not transparent for them. So that's what we've seen. I mean, there is this general complaint about uh, the type of uh, remedies that they can find when their content uh, gets removed. And there's also this uh, lack of capacity of independent media and civil society actors to comprehend uh, how content moderation and also content curation that is a lot more invisible works. Um, in our jobs, uh, in our work, we've, we've had a lot of conversations, for example, with indigenous communities that try to translate COVID-19 uh, measurements, state measurements to their language. And it got um, removed because it had to do with a topic that was in the, in, in that time, in 2020, it was like a political and public interest. I mean, it had a lot of misinformation guidelines that it had to follow. So that's one of our findings in these informal conversations because they are our partners. So they, they, they told us these kind of things. And there's also been a lot of uh, these uh, content moderation and curation happening when there are social upheavals uh, moments in Colombia. For example, in the protest, it, there were two cases that got overturned by the uh, Facebook oversight board and they were uh, really uh, illustrative of this point. I mean, this is public interest information that has to be produced in the same moment that it happens. And what happens is that a uh, public uh, does not understand, I mean, the public does not understand how this content moderation works and they perceive this as some kind of censorship that um, increments the pressure in these social upheaval moments. Uh, I would like to maybe stop there if, if that's okay, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for giving us a little bit of a, an overview on this. It's, uh, um, we also heard uh, from, from ADG Jalassi about the different discriminatory um, practices in different parts of the world and, and your research is absolutely um, insightful in this regard. Um, you mentioned that content removal practices, they're not transparent, um, but also the way information is being promoted or amplified is also not transparent. But we have a big, big question there, uh, particularly when it comes to not just content moderation, but content curation. Again, I keep mentioning content curation practices. What do I 
what do I mean by that? We're, I think we're really talking about sort of the data and advertising driven business models and the practices in which um, information is taking place, uh, information shaping is taking place through these type of systems. Um, and the impact this has on media pluralism, Dan, you mentioned the importance of media and media pluralism and the universal access to public interest. I did say at the beginning that we wanna talk about solutions. So I wanna turn it around a little bit into how, how do we move forward from, from, from this situation? Uh, the, there's, there's a lot of discussions on this topic. This isn't, I'm sure for any of you, I, I, know, I recognize there's many experts in the room, um, uh, a, a new a sort of discussion in that sense. Um, and, and, and some of the, the, the proposals that are coming out um, are also talking about things like perhaps reconfiguring um, these type of you know, recommender systems and these technologies that are used in content curation to make them more quote unquote responsible. So like responsible recommender systems um, to ensure that they don't just cause harm or that you prevent harm, but really prioritize public interest and newsworthy information. I'm sure we can have a whole other session on defining what is newsworthy information and what is public interest. If you have any, <laughs> you know, silver bullet answers to that, please uh, let me know. But do you think that this could be a way forward to sort of, I don't know, force platforms to reconfigure their recommender systems um, to, to prioritize public interest. Robin, I'm looking at, I'm looking at you because I'm going to turn to you with this question. What, I'm very skeptical. Of what, what do you think? You're skeptical. Yeah. Um, and what, what alternatives are there? What do you think we need in, in this regard? So, you know, the reason why I am skeptical uh, is because the algorithms that these company use, companies use do not stay constant. Um, they are configured and reconfigured in a near constant basis. Um, a lot of the times what these platforms have been doing over the last several years is that, is that they're configuring and reconfiguring along the lines of what they think the public interest might constitute. So, um, for instance, you know, following a period of massive clickbait on their sites back in 2013, Facebook tried to evaluate and reevaluate what they considered, uh, what, what could be considered high quality news. The ma massive problem with this is that um, when you are a Facebook, you have only a certain number of signals to work with, um, which uh, means that you know, how you are defining high quality news is still pretty limited. So firstly, they say, okay, we are going to define high quality news, meaning when somebody clicks on this um, and goes to a site and, and reads it. Uh, okay, so that leads to this effect. All right, we're going to define high quality news as when somebody clicks on this, goes to site, comes back to our site, and engages in a conversation. And uh, with each one of these changes, you know, unintended consequences happen. One of the major issues with something like the public interest standard is that it is already very vague. When we talk about its use within um, things like FCC decisions, um, it is something that has never really had a clear, you know, contours to it. And it is something that has been um, kind of deliberated and negotiated through a lot of different discussions and court cases um, and that are, you know, in direct relation to the context in which we're talking about the public interest standard at the time. When we talk about building something like the public interest standard into an algorithm, we are losing that deliberative effect. We are saying we are going to define it as this. One of the massive problems with that is that these are, you know, rather centralized systems organizations and users tend to learn how they operate. We think they're very opaque. They're actually pretty easily learnable, um, especially when you have like major institutions who have like a social media manager whose job it is to like look at all the signals and figure out what works and what doesn't work. But users are actually pretty good at this too. Um, so what we see is that we see this pattern of isomorphism where people adapt to the algorithm and then all the content becomes the same again. And then the platform needs to, you know, reconfigure um, as well, because everybody's kind of tied into the same sort of incentive structure. Um, so that's kind of the difficulties with moving forward, um, just in terms of trying to build in a public interest standard just into the algorithm itself. There are lots of different ways that platforms have tried to address this concept of the public interest, especially recently. Um, and they've done that through things like, okay, so with COVID-19, you know, 
Google had an information card. Facebook had a coronavirus information center. Twitter used things like the verified badge to find a bunch of different experts and then try and elevate them. So there are a lot of different ways that companies can think about the public interest standard through you know, user interfaces and um, other aspects of the design of the platform, but just the algorithm I don't think will do the trick. Well, I can take a stab and I can try and take a stab that's a little bit more optimistic, you know, um, just for the sake of, you know, the discussion. But um, I, I think that, well, and let me start with uh, an example that kind of shows you the challenge that we're facing. I, I don't know if you saw the, the the news out of Bloomberg yesterday that there are 49 content farms look, faking, trying to look like news outlets, you know, are publishing what looks like news and generating ad revenues through programmatic advertising. And they're all using chat GPT. And it became very obvious. They're just content farms. So they just plug something in, do a news result. So it now becomes very easy. And it's also very inexpensive to make something like this, mm -hmm. right? So this is a challenge to news, but it's also a challenge to advertisers because no one wants to put their advertising on basically what's a fraudulent website. And at the end of the day, really what this speaks to is that, especially with kind of generative AI and new capabilities, producing content is really easy. We know that there, the amount of contents that content that goes onto platforms is massive. It's kind of, it, you know, there, there is no way that we, we can just do it with all human moderation, right? We need to find some type of algorithmic moderation. Otherwise, there's no other way of, to go about it. So the issue to me seems like we need to figure out how to create signals that can be used and that identify what's trustworthy. So Seema, we have some research that's it's not published yet, but that's coming out on a couple different initiatives that are kind of under the rubric of the digital trust initiatives. So you have things like the Trust Project, which is primarily in the US that works with organizations to make sure that they're up to ethical standards. Um, NewsGuard is another one that kind of looks at whether outlets are by and large, trustworthy. Um, and then the, the Journalism Trust Initiative is also one that's kind of a co-regulatory mechanism where news organizations opt in and, and follow a certain number of procedures. And, and that that way we we kind of kind of gives us another signal about you know whether a news institution is trustworthy. What's positive about these is that it's not looking at the content itself. It's looking at, and it's also coming kind of from the news media sector. Because I think it, we, it will be very challenging to ask our friends at Facebook, Twitter, whatever, to, uh, even though we might want them to, to like to make those types of judgments, I think they're judgments that are better suited for the community within the kind of media freedom and, and, and free expression space. So I feel like generative AI, and this is where I'm trying to put this positive spin, we're going to see a whole lot more content. And maybe this is an opportunity where we can go back to the platforms and say, look, you, you know, you've done a little bit, but like you need to uh let some of these other stakeholders who can more can speak about what's trustworthy and what's not um in a way that also defends media freedom um because it's not content based and maybe they'll be more open to listening because i think their job is going to get a lot harder with the amplification of content thanks dan i look forward to reading that research you just mentioned um but particularly, I mean, you you made you made two important points. One is that you know some of these initiatives should uh, and and defining these type of content should come from um, the news media sector, but also other stakeholders. And I think that's an interesting discussion to be at. Who are the stakeholders that should be involved in this? Of course, it shouldn't just be platforms deciding, um, you know, what is as you mentioned, what is a high quality news. Uh, and, and Katarina, you, you you've mentioned specifically that you know the the, the scope when you look at it on the local and, and national and, and regional levels. Uh, we heard, of course, that these techno these technologies, AI algorithms, uh, we know they're bi they're they're biased. They they work in error prone ways. And then we have you know the significant challenge when it comes to the geographic and linguistic disparities that they have. But again, flipping to the solution side of these things, and we're talking about, you know, how do you not define, but how do you promote public interest information? How do you promote media content in this context of looking at also the issues around linguistic and geographic disparities? Have you found any sort of good recommendations or good practices, models that we can recommend to platforms in that regard? Um, and before I do, please also think about questions and raise your hand and get involved if you have any comments. Um, I want to keep this a little bit more open for a discussion. I know there's a lot of experts in the room and I recognize some faces, so I might even 
prod you later. <laughs> Maybe I don't have such an, a positive uh, view on this. What we found so far, for example, the certification process, I was thinking about when you were talking about, so there's this certification process for abortion clinics right now. And it is also only only based, uh, it is it can only be made by clinics in the, no, the global north. In Colombia, abortion is legal as of like two years ago, actually like 10 years ago. But right now, abortion clinics cannot promote their services because they cannot uh, make go through this certification process because there is it is not available for Colombia right now. So the certification process that you were talking about can be really hard for us because there is like this no, there is a really uh, a lack of power in the uh, global south area sometimes to make do with, with these uh, processes. Also, when you were mentioning like different stakeholders, we have that uh, civil society almost as a whole in Colombia is not aware of these uh, content moderation and curation practices and rules. They make do, like you said, they find a way to uh, post their, their content. And if they they make like three different copies for the same Im images, and if they, they get taken down, they go, or they put a filter on the image or something like that in order to solve their uh, content moderation issues. And that's it. That's the level of knowledge that they have regarding to content moderation practices. They do not go ask themselves what are the rules, what are the uh, community guidelines, how they can make a, an appeal on a case. They just make do with what they have, and that's it. I mean, that's content moderation for civil society as a whole in Colombia. I mean, there are like few uh, freedom of expression um, civil society organizations that can understand a little bit more uh, of this environment. But in general, uh, civil society does not have like this knowledge that can make them real, real powerful stakeholders in these discussions, not in our country, at least. So that would be like the first barrier in order to uh, formulate some more, uh, some standards regarding like these media outlets proposals that you're making. I mean, you have to first build some capacity for them to be like real uh, stakeholders in these conversations. And uh, yeah, that's that would be my take, maybe not so positive, I believe. Can I respond quickly? Yes. yes. Yeah. So I completely agree. So I've actually did I did a project on the trust project many years ago. Uh, it was a chapter of my dissertation, actually. And one thing that I found really interesting about these efforts is that you know often when these efforts are being brought in, they're still being brought in under the conditions that the platform set. So the platforms say, listen. The, the thing is, all you need to do is train the algorithm. Um, and so journalists start thinking automatically within the terms and guidelines of the way that the platform companies think and trying to articulate, okay, well, what is trust? This ephemeral nebulous concept that has a lot of different parts to it. How do we make it machine readable? What are those signals? That might not be something that's possible <laughs> um, to do. Um, and what, you know, what I think is the kind of main concern with some of these efforts is exactly this, is that like, there is still kind of a power imbalance in terms of how platforms operate and, and media operates and, and even within media. So like the news bargaining code in Australia benefited largely Rupert Murdoch, that like he made enormous amounts of money from that. And other news organizations did not. There's still power discrepancies that happen. Um, and we can't see this all as being on an equal plane because a lot of civil society, even within civil society organizations, you know, data society gets asked to comment and give a lot of advice. There is a lot of global inequity in terms of who these platforms are consulting and, 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 and when and why. Yeah. Thanks, no, a very important point, not only who these platforms are consulting, who they're opening the access to, like you mentioned, not only in terms of research, but uh, when we talk about media, even uh, the previous panel was talking about, you know, issues linked to um, the, the discrepancy of different uh, media outlets having more visibility, less visibility, more power, less power. Um, and there's also an issue of transparency when it comes to the practices that, that, that they have, but this is just one stakeholder. And one of the important um, other stakeholders, um, I think is, is um, governments and states and the positive obligations they have to protect our rights online. 
Um, at the OSC, we, we primarily actually target states in, in giving them guidance on how to regulate this space. I know that UNESCO is also working on, on, on a, a similar but more global initiative, of course. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear what you think about the role of the state, because there is, of course, a lot of sometimes unintended, sometimes very intentional consequences of giving that type of responsibility to states. Um, but before I do, I'd like to open the floor, and I see there's already a couple of um, hands up. There is a microphone, though I have to admit, I don't know where it is. If anybody sees it, could you? Thank you. <laughs> um, maybe just pass it to this gentleman here in, in the middle of the room, and then after that to Barbara. Thank you. I'll collect a couple of questions okay. and then. Hello. Yes. My name is Jesper Hoive. I'm the director of international media support. I'm certainly not an expert in this area, but I was just intrigued by the conversation about stakeholders and who to involve. And I, we have worked since the, just a week after the war broke out in Ukraine with Ukrainian media partners, uh, government institutions, relevant government institutions who are capable, because they've been capable and able since 2014 to actually understand uh, uh, miss this information, information that has been used by by Russia to um, campaign for their for their uh, agenda. And we brought them into a room with the tech companies, all the tech companies at the same time, and had a process since since the week after the war uh, broke out, and have met uh, and in, in initiated this based on uh, needs established by the, the Ukrainian media partners, civil society organizations, governments, and state institutions that have observed this development that the tech companies have not really addressed in, in 10 years where this has been a real uh, issue in, in Ukraine. And now one year later, we've had uh, you know a, a number of different roundtables. It's a sort of a roundtable process where uh, where the Ukrainian media partners have actually uh, brought in a white list of content producers of reliable uh, sources that the tech companies have taken in also in, in order to address issues around what to demote and what to promote of content. So it's a process that is difficult and, and there is no shining sort of impact, but the, 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 the main accountability a sort of problem that often exists has been addressed through the involvement of key key act key media actors that are more capable than any of us in in dealing with these issues from Ukraine. So they are the accountability measure up against the the tech companies. And the, and in that case, the, the tech companies have actually shown interest and and also sufficiently high level people have shown up because they've been in the same room, all of them at the same time. So it, it, and. The success from our side and from the media and civil society side in, in Ukraine has been whether they've seen a change in this, uh, and they have. And uh, and I think the tech companies, we had a meeting two weeks ago, a week ago, and they said this is the most important development that they have seen actually in involving local stakeholders, state institutions in, in addressing some of these extremely difficult issues. It 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 is not an absolute success story. Of course, it's really for all the reasons you're given. It's a it's a it's a it's a very complex issue. But I think we should not we should not avoid trying to learn from those good examples that that exist, and and then try to address these issues. Uh, sorry, yeah, that was a lengthy intervention, but I think we should we should not be too pessimistic. Although I agree that it's a complex issue. I think the Russian war on Ukraine is a very uh, interesting example, as we as we see right now, also in the OSC. Of course, it's a big issue that we're uh, um, working on, and um, we've been following and, and running workshops very closely with uh, different stakeholders in Ukraine, but also beyond, specifically on on this issue of how platforms are engaging with content uh, governance practices in times of crisis, in times of conflict, and it's an interesting one. Because on the one hand, um, and similar to what Katalina has mentioned earlier, um, Ukrainian uh, civil society and media for many years have been calling on platforms to recognize that, for example, their moderation practices, their algorithms shouldn't be primarily um, uh, programmed in, in Russian language, which it was, right? And they finally recognized that, okay, Ukrainian language also needs to be taken on board. They have, like you rightfully pointed, a much more open and immediate dialogue with stakeholders in Ukraine to address, you know, hate speech online, 
but it's not systematic yet. It's very responsive and ad hoc to the crisis and the conflict that they are facing. So it's an interesting case study. I think, like you say, hopefully a very good positive example that we can perhaps even, I mean, it's weird to call it a positive example under the circumstances, but um, in terms of learning from it at the very least, and maybe systematically finding a process that means we don't have to have a conflict or a crisis, but actually preemptively have a system to prevent the way in which these algorithms can amplify harmful content that can lead to these type of conflicts and crises. Um, I don't know if anyone, but Barbara, I know you wanted to take the floor, well, but I just want, like, now I don't mean to be overly pessimistic. I've seen this ebb and flow forever. And I do think, you know, the platform, I just uh, submitted final edits on a paper called Network Platform Governance. It's all about how these platforms have been engaging civil society organizations in really interesting ways for many, many years now, um, and the kind of benefits and drawbacks that can come, come out of that. I think one thing I would say is one of the main issues I have seen with platforms coming out of these processes is their desire and willingness to pivot away. So make sure it's an ongoing conversation. Um, and one thing, you know, one thing that happened with the Trust Project actually was that uh, in a lot of these conversations with news media organizations, they would have like a point person at the company um, that would serve as the liaison. That person would get moved. And then the organization would have to reestablish a relationship back at the company again. And this just kept happening again and again and again. So I would say, you know, keep the relationship strong and keep the relationships ongoing. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we need oversight over, not just the algorithms themselves, but these kinds of relationships that these companies are making with stakeholders on the ground, making sure that they're investing in these relationships. And that when, you know, a bit of a crisis comes, it's not the first thing cut. Uh, because people are relying on it. I mean, I think that's a really good point because, I mean, it's not pessimistic. It's just the truth that the companies are cutting their trust and safety teams. Obviously, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Meta's yeah. already laid off half, probably going to lay it off up to about the other half. Um, so it is a race to the bottom at the moment, which makes these types of things even more difficult going forward. Yeah. Barbara, you have the microphone. Already. Yes. Hi, hi, everyone. I'm Barbara Bukowska from Arctic 19. And we have been... I have one comment and then one question. So we have been kind of grappling with these issues which you described, like what is independent media, public interest content, and, and, and so on. And there are you know, plenty of studies how difficult it is to operationalize some you know, normative values like diversity in algorithms and then how it will be for public interest. And a part of like fundamental question and a fundamental discussion, which is I think essential when we think about designing and developing this public interest algorithm, I understand from what you were saying, like there are two potentials here. Like one is to what I like described is to ask platforms to, to develop them. And the other one is to ask others to, to, to develop them or let platforms open the door for others to, um, to, to, to use them on their platform. And this is something which we have been advocating for. We have been asking companies to unbundle their curation and content moderation services and let others, including universities or nonprofits. But I think this comes to my questions. Like we really need to realize that it's not gonna be easy to monetize them, uh, these algorithms, although like it's very kind of important and you know public interest and so on, but the, the market for them, I don't think there is. I think there is a market for recommend the system, but not different, at least different market for the algorithms. And we cannot assume that somebody will be developing them just for the sake of it. So this needs to be heavily subsidized and heavily, you know, incentivized. And then it comes to the question like by whom? So, and there's a danger of capture by the states if states are subsidizing them, um, there is a capture. And then also if, if private individuals. So what, how do you see kind of monetary aspect of this issue? Or can we make the companies to kind of, I don't know, create a trust and then pay them, pay pay this algorithms, uh, third parties development by them? Because when we try to, uh, to calculate if Article 19 was developing this, it was in a range of like $10 million. And who is gonna invest in that kind of money for an NGO or like university? So Thanks. thank you. Thanks, Barbara. 
big and difficult uh, question. Before I come back to the panel, I just want to check because we have about six, seven minutes left. If there's any other questions or comments, just to flag that now. I see one in, in the back. Um, maybe we can pass the microphone along. I'll just take the two last questions and then maybe you can respond to, to all of them and we can wrap up. I know that we're keeping you from lunch probably, so it's not an easy task to... Do you, do you guys want to answer? You want me to go ahead and okay. pose my question? Please do pose your question. And like I said, we have five minutes, so if you can keep it a little bit brief. Oh, okay. Thank my name so my name is Lena. I'm the founder of a startup called Sourceable, which is trying to empower citizen journalists to verify their data, to give it to media and NGOs. Um, so my question is, what innovation or development technology do you believe would be particularly impactful um, and most useful in creating a healthier online information ecosystem, um, and especially as uh, it relates to the media world? I've talked a lot, so I want to open it up to you guys. And we have one more, one more question. question. And then Hi, my name is Juliana Uribe. Uribe. I'm the CEO of Mobilizatorio, a citizen engagement lab for Latin America. I would love to hear your perspectives in terms of media literacy and education in general, because it feels like this is like a conversation that is going to take time. What can citizens do or what can education organizations and civil society do in terms of empowering ourselves to face um, what is happening and your perspective on that? Thank you. So we have three think, questions. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can kind of take a stab at. I mean, one of the ones that I want to answer is is the one that you asked me is about like who are the stakeholders that need to be involved because I feel like that's fundamental. I think it's related to the the question, the final question that we got about media capacity, right? Because I think you know, I think based on the partners that we work with, there is kind of a fear that the conversation can be primarily between governments who are going to regulate tech platforms and then the platforms. And that, you know, in the global South and the countries that we're most concerned about, that often means that those types of voices are squeezed out and not taken into account and that the regulation is going to end up being uh, a form of, of censorship, right? And so at, at SEMA, you know, uh, and more broadly at NED, we really believe in kind of multi-stakeholder digital governance. And it's really important that we build the capacity of media to engage in these things. And I think that's also part of the, the point I was making um, around, it, you know, the tech companies, they have a business model. They, you know, what's trustworthy news, the, the, the editorial process, that's kind of um, outside of what they're typically thinking about. And so it really is incumbent upon media stakeholders to, to be more strong and, and up and so I think that the proposition around um, outsourcing the algorithmic model is an interesting one. I'm not sure if it's, it's necessarily feasible, but I think that Again, we need to create some type of signals that can be incorporated into the algorithms or the AI. And I think that's where recommendations around transparency and processes, which is what um, Ms. Hiberto was talking about. You know, she's, she was saying, you know, this needs to be looked look at the process. And so we need companies and governments to agree on processes that are indeed multi-stakeholder and then include the voices of the, the media outlets. Because, you know, we have tons of examples that we've talked about here of media outlets that have felt trouble engaging with platforms, really important news information, getting not getting out to publics. Um, and we, we have, you know, we filtered these up as much as we can. It's great when, a, you know, or not, it's great, but like when a crisis emerge, things do change, right? But in all the other places where we're flagging this, nothing's happened. So I think it is about building a process and about, you know, if there's a way that we could make sure that the companies have to have these types of relationships, mm. um, you know, that would be a step forward. Let's go to the BSA. Um, yeah. I now apologize to Adeline because I'm giving her the most ungrateful task of <laughs> summarizing all of these issues or providing a bit of a, a an overview for those of us, including myself, who are jet lagged. We can have a nice summarized takeaway from, from Adeline. I'll be fast. I'll try at least. Hi, everyone. So my name is Adeline, working for UNESCO. Um, indeed, thank you, Denise. We'll try to wrap up quickly what was discussed today. So, But first of all, big thanks to our speakers um, for your contribution and great insights to this discussion. And to all of you for joining us today. Uh, with the digitalization, we live in a world that, where information is more accessible than ever. 
But this newfound abundance of information has come with a new set of challenges, many of which have been highlighted by our speakers. We've heard in the opening remarks of Mrs. Ribeiro and uh, Mr. Gelassi that um, in their early days, social media platforms were seen as a powerful, powerful, um, sorry, uh, force for good and enabling connection between people, increasing access to information, but that this perception right now has changed and acting as gatekeepers, only a small number of dominant social media platforms today control what a huge number of people get to see and see online. They have a direct impact on the dynamic of content distribution as well on media diversity and freedom of expression online. And one particular concern that was discussed at the beginning is the spread of hate speech and disinformation. Social media have been accused with their business model of prioritizing profit over safety and making uh, through algorithms that promote the consumption of harmful contents. But today, the objective of the discussion was really to discuss the other side of the coin. While pl platforms are using um, technologies for capturing attention, which tends to, pro to promote harmful contents, how does this impact on access to public interest information? And how does this impact on media and pluralism, which is an important conversation to have on a World Press Freedom Day? Um, and as a growing majority of people consume news on social media, the big question still is, how do we govern the relationship between media and social media? Um, among the issues that were at stake and highlighted by our speakers, um, we have the structural dependency of media over large platform and the power imbalance. Um, David has talked about the overlapping financial crisis of media and particularly highlighted the need to support small independent media outlets. The fact that this is something that was not really discussed much today, but the fact that content shared by media is removed, suspended, downranked by social media platforms, although shared sometimes by media that adhere to self-regulation, which brings also some question about the fact that platforms, community standards would have precedence over media professional standards. And this is a big discussion in Europe right now with the European Media Freedom Act, for instance. Um, the fact also that public interest content is removed, suspended, downranked without transparent possibility to seek remedy and engage in a dialogue with social media platform. And this is something, again, that was highlighted by Catalina. You gave a lot of examples, but the fact that um, this is very problematic because social media platforms have been investing much less in content moderation in many parts of the world. Um, and again, if there would be time, I could give you a lot of examples that we have collected as part of the project Social Media for Peace, where we've seen that journalists, for instance, reporting on issues of public interest, uh, we have the case in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, journalists were telling us, well, they can hardly report on war crime judgments, for instance, because the AI doesn't make the distinction between promoting war, war crimes and uh, reporting about it. So these are really like serious issues that we need to, to, to discuss and, 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 and try to, to find some solution. And this was also the idea, thanks, Denis, to discuss what should be the solution um, for a healthier information ecosystem and that ensures access to information. Uh, public interest information. Uh, Robin, you mentioned the different initiatives to define public interest uh, standards and highlighted how these standards are still vague. But you highlighted as well the different ways that the platforms are already trying to address the issue, information cards, verify, verified badges, and other ways to elevate public interest standards. But one point that was raised and everybody found it quite interesting, I think, is the fact that there are a lot of global inequalities about whom social media platforms are consulting. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, Catalina, you uh, mentioned the examples of Colombia and the lack of capacities of, global, of local stakeholders to actually provide solutions. So I think one of the recommendations um, that I would take from this panel as a first one is that to work on building capacities of local stakeholders um, to, to, uh, to be part of this conversation and to be able to provide some of the solution. Um, David, you highlighted the various initiatives developed by the media community to create signals to, uh, to identify what is trustworthy information online and how to connect this maybe with the advertising industry. You've mentioned some projects and initiatives like the Trust Project, the GTI, and the fact that it's quite positive that it's coming from the media and the news media sector themselves. And last, uh, Barbara left, but we've heard as well some innovative solution, the need to have more recommender system available uh, on the platform. 
so that it would mean that uh, we, the user, we would be less dependent on any single recommender system. Uh, we would have more channels to access media content. Uh, but this, and this is maybe the less positive thing in the end, would be to say that this would need still to be heavily subsidized. Uh, we would need to ensure that those are not captured by states, for instance. So thank you. I hope I've managed to summarize it. <laughs> but thank you once again for your participation. Let's continue this important conversation. And as uh, it is, I said at the beginning, we must do more just the, than just reacting to the harms. And we need to provide a vision of what a healthy ecosystem should be. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Just to say thank you for this excellent uh, summary. I've been also taking notes of the recommendations that we can follow up on. And thank you to our wonderful panel of experts. Um, it's been really, really uh, helpful to hear you from your research. You've really done a lot and will continue to do a lot of work in this area. And we really look forward to also continuing to work together with, with all of you on these issues. And mostly thank you to all of you. It's, um, and happy World Press Freedom Day. I think I would end on that note. So. <laughs> Thank you. I never have a card. Data and society. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm not even sure. 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 I'm not Sorry, we have um, websites that are specially built for that in general. So I imagine that just makes it easier to do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does it mean, like targeting, like it's a website that like just highlights, like, like focuses on that journalist and said, no? Oh. It focuses on creating short news uh -huh. that are centered on a certain journalist or human rights defenders with some possibility in it, like one or two actual information. Yeah. You know, for instance, John Smith working for CCRP and then a lot of, you know, attacks and Mandela content, and then that's posted on, on website. 